All right, I think it's time to get started. So um, welcome. This is going to be a Container D deep dive, a little bit of a continuation from the intro session we had yesterday afternoon. Um, a slightly different cast of characters. Mike Brown and I did yesterday's intro. I'm going to give you kind of a quick start, uh, but then Derek uh, is one of our maintainers is going to do the bulk of uh, the deep dive presentation into the architecture and, and finish up with a demo. Uh, but just to kind of get us get us going, uh, one of the things we didn't cover as much yesterday was you know, where is Containerd kind of on that maturity path of, you know, who's using it, uh, where is it within the CNCF? So I thought we'd give you a few minutes of that before we dig a little deeper. Um, and also down the left side, uh, this list of projects, as Derek goes over the architecture, these are great examples, places you can actually go look. You can go look at the code on GitHub and see how each of these projects are using you know, the, the Go API library to actually drive Containerd to do the work that they're doing. So uh, Mike gave you, if you came to the intro session, Mike covered the CRI, so that's the Container Runtime Interface uh, from Kubernetes. So how does Kubernetes drive Containerd uh, when, you know, for example, the kubelet wants to start a pod? So you can look at the CRI project and see how that uses the Containerd services. Uh, so that's one great uh, sort of integration that's that's clear and understandable. Um, Docker is sort of on the path to use more of Containerd, and so uh, the runtime aspect of Containerd has been um, in use by the Docker engine since 17.12, uh, so all through 2018, all those releases. And then uh, there's work underway to start to uh, refactor Docker to use the image side of container D instead of the code that's in the Docker engine today. So you can expect to see a lot of that work happen in 2019. If you've heard of BuildKit, which is the open source project that, that uh, can now be used to drive Docker build, the back end of that uses container D's uh, client and it can even run standalone uh, without the rest of Docker or it can even drive a uh, run C. So again, BuildKit is a great place to look at a container D use case. Uh, Alibaba's Pouch Container, that's another open source project from Alibaba uh, Cloud in China. Uh, they're using Containerd uh, as a runtime, also using both the image and runtime aspects of Containerd. Uh, there's also, uh, and this is an exhaustive list, um, but a couple of our, our own maintainers and reviewers have interesting projects that again are great places. So if you look at Michael Crosby's Boss project, that uses the Containerd uh, Go library, and Evan Hazlett's Stellar project uh, also is another great example of using Containerd as a runtime. Um, so anyway, that, that gives you a flavor of, of, you know, as you see the architecture and see how, how it comes together, these are projects that are actually using it today. Um, we just completed a security review uh, that the CNCF provides to all member projects. Uh, we're gonna be publishing that online, a, a PDF, report from a security company. Uh, it's very, very positive, um, and, and so we're excited to, to share that. Um, kind of in that same vein, we've also proposed to graduate within the CNCF, so you know, Kubernetes has graduated as well as FluentD, I believe. Um, and so uh, you can look at the PR in the CNCF TOC, um, and again, that expresses where we are as a project, how we meet all the criteria for the CNCF uh, graduation uh, criteria. We presented that just last month to the TOC, and I think we can expect some kind of graduation vote um, early in the year. So again, that gives you a picture of, of a little bit about who's integrating Container D using it today, um, and some of the maturity and where we are as a project. And with that, I'm going to let Derek uh, take over and, and do the deep dive. All right. So we're going to kind of take uh, the same architecture diagram that we went over in the intro yesterday. Uh, we're going to go into it in a slightly uh, different depth. Uh, so I'm going to focus more on the different components that are actually inside the, the daemon. Uh, so yesterday we kind of talked about how Containerd is built around having these loosely coupled services um, and, and these strongly defined interfaces between those services. 
Uh, so I'm going to go through a few of those um, and highlight how uh, you as an integrator can both integrate with these services and uh, can build plugins that are used within Containerd. Um, so Containerd has this smart client model. Uh, so what this means is the, the actual Go Containerd client, it implements many of the higher level functionality. So when you think of push-pull, that's done actually inside the Containerd client. Uh, we provide uh, a very usable uh, interface for uh, integrating with our, with our client library. Uh, and this is what you'll see Mobi integrating with, pouch containers, our own tool CTR, uh, the boss tool that uh, Phil mentioned. They all just directly use the Containerd client. Um, and then the Containerd client itself obviously uh, communicates with our Containerd API. Uh, so the Containerd API is, is very low level. It mirrors roughly the, the services that we have underneath it. Uh, so you can think of like the snapshot or the content service, the container services we have. Those are all exposed directly through uh, our Containerd API. Uh, this API we consider very stable. It's intended to be uh, backwards compatible all through uh, 1.x releases. Um, and then actually inside the Containerd daemon, we have this uh, service level. Uh, so this is what actually exposes all of the services we have to the rest of Containerd. So if you're implementing a plugin, you can access any of the Containerd service interfaces. Um, so it makes it really easy, for example, if you want uh, uh, to build something like the CRI plugin. The CRI plugin um, is just able to uh, use these internal services directly without going through the API. Um, and then we have a metadata store that sits roughly right, right underneath the service interfaces. So this will actually be able to provide namespacing and labeling to uh, some of our even lower level components such as snapshotters. So the things that actually uh, touch files on disk, uh, we try to make those as simple as possible. Um, and then we can provide layers on top of it to add additional functionality, um, as well as uh, provide different guarantees, such as uh, atomicity at the metadata level, uh, so that uh, every single plugin doesn't have to worry about that, uh, as well as namespacing. Uh, so the, the metadata service itself is uh, what actually does the namespacing. And this will actually namespace all your images, all your containers, all your snapshots, all the content, uh, even down to the, the labels that are uh, put on any of these objects. Uh, so basically any object that you're using within Containerd itself is namespace. And this is primarily to support multiple clients. So Containerd is designed to be used within Docker, within Kubernetes, uh, within any platform that wants to run containers. Um, but it's designed in such a way that they don't step on each other. If, if one of them is pulling images, managing containers, uh, you don't have to worry about some other uh, platform or tool that you're using uh, interfering with those containers accidentally. Uh, so let's take a deeper look at what, uh, what the metadata service is actually doing. So the metadata uh, service is actually implemented in Bolt DB. So it's, it's completely atomic. Uh, it, has, uh, it has references to the different objects. Uh, most of these references are implemented through labels. Uh, but for example, when you pull an image, um, it's going to pull all the content down. It's going to put it in the content store. And it's also going to reference it in the metadata store, as well as the relationships between all of the content that was pulled. Um, likewise with images. Uh, the images itself is just in the metadata store. There's no there's no separate uh, backend uh, for images. The, the metadata stores are actual backend. Um, and that will link to the actual content that got pulled. Uh, likewise for snapshots. Snapshots tend to be something that's very heavy on disk. Uh, but managing those snapshots can be complicated. So the metadata store is actually what takes care of managing kind of what snapshots exist, uh, what namespace they belong to, and what the relationships between that snapshots as well as the content that they're related to. Um, and this really helps us when we want to do uh, something like deleting an image. Uh, so Containerd actually has garbage collection that is able to take care of uh, cleaning up this data when something gets deleted. So 
In this case, if we were to delete the Redis image, uh, you could see that the Redis image was based off the Alpine image. Um, in the content, I, uh, I labeled uh, the green stars actually represent the OCI manifest. Uh, the yellow stars represent the OCI images. So these are kind of the, these are the image configs that actually uh, specify what are the layers, what are the runtime parameters, everything for that image. Um, and then the red stars are going to represent the, the actual compressed tar layers. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the, the Redis image is actually pointing to a manifest which references two layers, whereas the Alpine layers, uh, the Alpine image only has a single layer. You can see how those translate to the snapshots. Uh, so when you actually want to delete the Redis image, we can just delete the Redis image uh, from the API. Nothing needs to happen right away. Uh, but when the, garbage collector, when the garbage collection runs, it's actually going to go through and it's going to see that there's content that's no longer referenced. Uh, so in this case, since we actually have a Redis container which is running, which is pointing at a uh, read-write snapshot, that read-write snapshot is referencing that, that Redis layer which was, uh, which was owned by that, that image that just got removed. However, the garbage collector is going to see that it's owned and it's not going to clean up that particular uh, snapshot, but it will be able to clean up any of the content that was associated with the poll. So this content is going to be the artifacts that it got from the registry, and they would also be artifacts that you could push to another registry, for, for example. Uh, so after the garbage collection, uh, it's going to look like this inside the metadata store. So now when we go back through and we want to actually delete the container, uh, normally we delete the read-write layer of this, the read-write snapshot layer at the same time we delete the container. Uh, but you, you can guess what's going to happen here. Uh, when the garbage collection runs, it's going to see that now there's a snapshot that is no longer being referenced. And it's going to go ahead and, and delete that snapshot. So our final state in this case is we just have a Alpine image. Uh, so the, the way we've kind of implemented the garbage collection in container D is uh, we have the metadata store, which is in bolt DB. Uh, we, we try to avoid locking this as much as possible. So we do this, uh, this garbage collection very quickly. But as you all know, that uh, content and snapshot actually represent fairly uh, a lot of data on disk sometimes, which deleting data on disk can be very slow. Uh, so this is representative of what, what we actually do inside the metadata store for deletion. Um, but we actually have a multi-stage garbage collector that will actually go through and it will, for each of the individual uh, content stores or snapshotters, it will do a separate garbage collection uh, when there's data that's been removed. So as mentioned, snapshot sum uh, about uh, how you can implement your own snapshot. And uh, we've tried to make a, an interface that's both a mix of powerful and simple. Um, and one of the ways we tried to achieve that was by removing operations that really make snapshotters difficult to implement. Uh, so you'll see that there's absolutely no data operations inside our snapshotter interface. You're not going to see any data being streamed into or out of the snapshotter. Um, if you're familiar with Docker graph drivers and how they work, um, they actually handle tar streams uh, to and from, uh, which can make them fairly complicated to implement as you're then responsible for understanding tar and how to uh, compress, decompress, and unpack those. Um, there's no mounting, which allows you to implement a snapshotter that's fairly stateless. Uh, so as soon as you have to deal with mounts, you have to deal with whether or not you can unmount. Uh, so it, it brings up a lot of uh, extra reference counting that's needed, a lot of tracking that goes along with, with owning those mounts that you create. Uh, so in container D, we return an array of mounts. And you can think of those array of mounts as just a description for how that snapshotter can be mounted. Um, snapshots themselves, when you create them, so we have a prepare command, which will create a mutable snapshot. When you're done with it, you commit it, and that snapshot can no longer be altered in any way. So for example, when we're doing a poll, we're, we're preparing each layer. Uh, we're unpacking into that layer, and then we're, gonna, we're just going to commit it. Uh, and it's up to the, the actual poll operation to, 
determine how it's going to mount and, and do that unpacking. Um, we, there is label support in here, so, so the stats and info that you can set on snapshotters can themselves have labels. This is mostly used at the metadata store level, um, but the, the snapshotters themselves can support those labels. Um, I put enumeration there because that's something that was kind of missing from the, the Docker implementation and of graph drivers. Um, where this really helps out is the ability to clean up. So when you have the ability to enumerate, you have the ability to know kind of what's actually there and, and, and make decisions about what can be deleted. Um, it also helps, uh, helps you kind of just do better tracking of, of what's there as well as giving APIs to the client where you can actually see what all your, what all your snapshotters are, or all the snapshots in the snapshotter are. Uh, in the 1.2 release, we added a feature called proxy snapshotter. It's, uh, basically, it gives you the ability to run a snapshotter that's external to the Containerd process uh, so that you don't have to recompile Containerd to use uh, your snapshotter. Uh, so if you've been following uh, Firecracker at all, they're using this to implement a, a snapshotter. Um, for configuring Containerd, uh, we have a proxy plugin section. In there, you just specify a name. Uh, so in this case, I think it would be called my snapshotter. Uh, you specify a type, and then the address is always just a unit socket. And as you can see in the example, it's just going to uh, listen on that unit socket, and Containerd will be able to connect to that. And uh, what I mentioned about kind of these, these interfaces and how we use them within Containerd, that snapshot or interface is used at every level of Containerd, whether it's the client, the API, the backend, they all use the same snapshot or interface. So to actually implement this proxy plugin, you just implement uh, the snapshot or interface, and that can be used on either side of uh, gRPC. Uh, 1.2, we, uh, we also released a new plugin feature for runtimes. So in the V1 of our runtimes, we had the ability to make it pluggable, but it, it wasn't super easy to, to implement. Uh, we had this gRPC interface that uh, could be implemented, um, but there were some limitations with it. Uh, for example, stats. We didn't have a stats endpoint, so if you were trying to implement a runtime that was inside of the VM and you needed to get stats, it was somewhat difficult. So uh, now we actually added a, a, stats, uh, a stats function inside of the task service so that if you want to implement a runtime plugin, uh, you can do everything, including uh, creating or including returning your own stats. Uh, so the the biggest feature with 1.2 wasn't necessarily that we introduced this new uh, runtime. We did add a, a few endpoints to it, um, but mainly we stabilized it so that uh, people can feel comfortable going out and actually implementing against this uh, API, and uh, we'll continue to support it. Uh, so it, it, it should make it much easier to implement these plugins. And we've already seen uh, interest in, in actual implementations of this with Firecracker, Kata Containers, uh, GVisor, uh, to name a few. And obviously, we have a Run C implementation. Um, another advantage to this approach is uh, I, I kind of wrote it in a confusing way. It says, at most, one per container, which I had to actually stop and think about for a second. but. What that means is previously we would always be one shim uh, for one container, um, but now it's at most one shim per one container. So if you have 10 containers running, you can have 10 shims, but you could also have all those 10 containers sharing the same shim. Uh, so this is useful in the VM scenario where uh, you may have one VM and multiple containers inside that VM. Uh, say, for example, they're all in the same pod. Uh, you wouldn't have to have a bunch of extra processes being used to, to manage all of these, all of these containers. Um, and so that was, that was another minor change that we made to the, this API, is just passing in the ID uh, for each of the tasks so that this API can be used across multiple, uh, multiple running tasks. So and 
as somebody who's using Containerd, you're most likely going to be starting with the with our Go client. Uh, the Go client has gotten fairly positive uh, feedback. Uh, it's 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 fairly simple to use, um, and we provide a lot of uh, with functions. It's, it's probably the best way to describe it. Uh, so at almost any point of the API, you can change whatever you want. Um, so in the services section, we're actually defining uh, which services you can use. By default, it will just you do everything over uh, gRPC, but you can override any, any one service. Uh, so you can make it, you could run Containerd completely embedded. You could, you could implement all of these interfaces yourself if, if you want to, um, and still use the client and make use of those higher level functionalities. So an example of this would be like, say you wanted to build a tool which pulls something from a registry, um, but you don't want to actually have a running Containerd. Uh, all you have to do is implement the, the content store interface, and then you can make use of that higher level functionality, and it will store it to uh, wherever you define it to be stored in the content store. Um, I, I tried to highlight the, the resolver here. So it's the resolver is uh, define whenever you do a pull operation, and this is another interface that you can completely, uh, completely overwrite. Um, I didn't specify what. Uh, I don't have a slide that shows what this interface looks like, um, but it's it's fairly simple. It's you resolve a a name to uh, a digest, and then uh, you can fetch individual blobs uh, using uh, just the hash. Uh, so by default, we have an implementation that uses the, the Docker registry API, which is now uh, the OCI distribution specification. Um, but it's fairly unopinionated in our implementation. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of the flows that we have uh, in Containerd today. So th this flow is the same based on, like, doesn't really matter what uh, resolver you have. But um, the default remote will be some, some sort of registry. Uh, so in our CTR tool, we actually have top-level commands for pull, fetch, and unpack. Um, normally, you're just familiar with pull. Um, so the first thing that pull does is just going to fetch the content. Uh, fetch is just going to the registry. It's going to this remote, and it's pulling down the content and putting it in the content store. It's not really doing anything else besides that. Um, the only tricky part is it has to understand OCI manifest so that it knows how to walk the, the tree of objects that are associated with an image. Um, at the end of a fetch, it will just uh, take the image that you tried to pull, and it will create a record in the metadata store saying that this image now refers to this uh, OCI manifest. Uh, so when the pull comes along, it's able, to, uh, uh, it's able to actually see now what that image represents, and then to do an unpack on that. Uh, on that manifest, it will just take that content now. Um, it knows what the layers are. It will read those layers from the content store, and it will unpack them into the snapshotter. And that's all a pull is. Uh, you could do the unpack yourself if you have your own content. Uh, there's nothing really here that's uh, not configurable um, and not exposed in our, in our client. So push flow in Containerd is, is very simple. Uh, Containerd doesn't build images. Our CTR tool doesn't build images. Um, it pushes them. So if you have an image, you have the content, uh, it takes that image, it takes that content, and it pushes it to a registry. That's it. Uh, if you want to build images, you can use something like BuildKit or uh, other tooling that's being uh, developed in order to uh, create new content. Uh, but Containerd runs, runs images. It doesn't create them. Um, so running a container, that's uh, one of the most important things we want to do in Containerd. Um, it's using uh, many of the same underlying services. Uh, so when you go to run, the first thing that's always done is it's going to uh, do an initialization step. So this is going to actually read, read the image that you want to run. It's going to look at the configurations. It's going to create the OCI specification. It's going to create a new read-write uh, layer in the snapshotter. Um, and then with those, it's going to set up a new container for you. Um, that new container is going to have now 
uh, defined root of s, which is, uh, will be represented most likely from a snapshotter um, and the OCI configuration uh, that was created. Uh, once you have a container created, you can start that container. That the start is actually going to mount your snapshot and it's going to start the, the task that you specified. So um, I wanted to kind of drill down into what has changed with the runtime v2. Uh, so at the lowest level of run, uh, we have this, this shim runtime manager. Um, and this is actually what's managing all the individual shims um, that, that are owning the, the running processes. Um, so when we actually get to the point where we're, we're starting these uh, containers, it's going to take in this OCI, spe this OCI specification. Uh, it creates a bundle directory. So if you're familiar with run C, you know what these, these bundle directories look like. They're specification, they're root of S. Um, and then this is kind of the, the main change that we did with uh, 1.2 for the, for the V2 uh, runtime is now we have a, a shim start. So the shim start is going to take that bundle directory um, and it's, it's gonna call into the shim binary that's defined for that runtime. Uh, so this plugin is, is it's just a binary that implements a, a few functions like start. Um, it's going to, the, that binary, when it's started, it's going to actually return uh, a path to uh, a Unix socket. And that, that Unix socket is going to implement the, the interface that I showed earlier for the, the runtime service task interface. Um, and this start, it can do really one of two things. It can, it can uh, create a new shim uh, that's going to manage that container, or it can use an existing shim, and it can return the same path uh, to another, another running shim. Uh, then that, that uh, Unix socket is going to get connected to, and the task create function is going to be called, and now you actually have a task, and you can call all the you can exec it, you can start it, you can do any, anything that you uh, need to do with a task, uh, including getting the stats. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and give a demo. Uh, actually, I'll see the time here. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna start off by demoing <coughs> the Snapshotter proxy plugin. Uh, so I'm gonna show the what an example of one of these proxy plugins actually looks like when it's running, uh, as well as um, some of the commands in CTR uh, for looking at snapshots. So this is just a proxy plugin that, uh, I don't know if it's this, uh, this one is not in the repo, but it uses this, uh, this contrib snapshot service. Um, so the snapshot service is basically just taking the snapshotter API and it's uh, creating a gRPC service for it. Uh, so an example app or an example plugin can be very simple. Creates a new gRPC server, uh, creates a new snapshotter. Uh, the snapshotter could be your own custom snapshotter. In this case, I'm just using one of our built-in snapshotters, the the native snapshotter, which is um, which is the simplest possible implementation of a snapshotter. It just copies uh, up every layer. Um, and then we use the uh, snapshot service from Contrib. That's going to actually create the gRPC service, register it, uh, and then listen. That's pretty much it. Uh, so let's show that running. Uh, let me also sh let me show you the what the config is going to look like. Uh, it showed it earlier, but. In this case, so you can see the proxy plugin section, uh, this test s, test s is test ss is going to be the uh, test snapshotter. Um, so that's actually going to be the name of the snapshotter that's used, and you'll you'll see that in a second. Um, and this is the actual path uh, which it will connect to. Uh, so let me go ahead and run this snapshotter. Okay, so this is just running that binary. Uh, you can see that same path. Uh, it's going to use this directory for snapshots. Uh, it should be running. 
Uh, let's go ahead and pull an image from a local registry I have. So you can see in this command, I'm uh, just going to use a demo namespace. So this is actually my running container D that I have. So I have uh, images and stuff that I just use normally for either development or just running containers. Um, so I'm just going to create a demo namespace. Uh, this is the same snapshotter name that you saw inside the config. And then we're just going to do CTR images pull uh, from a local registry. Um, it's really fast because it didn't have to go over the network. Um, let's look inside. It was temp test plugin uh, root. Uh, so this is, this is what the, the native snapshotter is going to do. So it's going to have a database file as well as the snapshots directory. Uh, and then these are the actual snapshots. So as I said, this is, this is a, the simplest uh, snapshotter. So if I look inside 6, that should be the last one created. Uh, it's just going to be a normal rootfs. Um, when, when it actually runs, it's basically just going to be a bind mount. Um, there's, there's nothing too tricky there. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at, I'll show you some of the snapshot commands we have. Uh, so we can use the same arguments. Um, you can also just set these as environment variables. Uh, so CTR snapshots ls. That's going to just show you all your all your snapshots. Now, it's just a lot of hashes. Uh, you can see that there's a key, there's a parent, there's a kind. The kind basically just says whether or not it's active, meaning that you can make changes to it, or committed, meaning that it's immutable. Uh, so let's call tree. Tree's more interesting output. Uh, so this will actually show you the relationships between them. Um, so you can still see the parentage, uh, but you can also see here this one at the bottom. This is going to be the last one that was uh, pulled. So this is this would be the the uppermost layer uh, for how most of us think about layers, um, even though here it's at the bottom. But whatever. Uh, so <laughs> let me create a new snapshot. So I'm I'm going to take this and I'm going to do basically what what you're going to do when you're initializing a snapshotter for a container which is you're going to call snapshots prepare. Uh, so I'm going to call this upper one. Um, it's using the same ID as uh, you saw as the upper from the tree. That's just going to create a new snapshot. So if I run tree again, you'll see that now there's this new, um, there's, yeah, there's, there's a new snapshot. And that snapshot is now above the other one, or, or the parent is now that, that previous snapshot that we mentioned. Um, so let me go ahead and yeah, let's let's mount that. So I'm going to make a directory. I already mounted it earlier. I'm sure, it's empty. Yeah, it's empty. Um, so in CTR, we also have a snapshots mount. Uh, so snapshots themselves don't mount, but when you run it, it'll give you a mount that you can you can run. Uh, remember what I said before, it's really simple. It's just a bind mount. So it's just, uh, this tool is just a convenience tool for helping you debug. It will just give you a mount command uh, that you can run. I'm not running as roots. Let me sudo that. Uh, so now when I go back to tempm, you can actually see that there's a root file system there. And you know I could trude into it and pretend like I'm inside a container. It's, uh, it's, the, same thing that the, it's the same thing that the runtime is going to do when it goes to run the container. Um, but this is a good way to give you kind of visibility into the snapshots. Um, let me demonstrate some cool stuff around garbage collection real quick, and then we're, we're going to be out of time. So let me unmount that, and then we're going to... So I'm going to go ahead and remove the Redis Alpine image. Uh, so this is similar to... Uh, what I showed earlier. So when I actually delete that, you'll see all the content got garbage collected. Uh, so you can see the garbage collection ran. Uh, it took 11, uh, 11 milliseconds. And then a subset of that should be how long the, the database was actually locked for. Um, during that time, it deleted all of these, uh, all of the content that's no longer used. So if I were to go back and actually try to look at the content. I didn't show this earlier, but uh, you would have seen all those content. Now there's actually nothing there. But 
you can see that the, the snapshot is still there. Uh, so let's now we'll go ahead and let's just remove that upper. I, I already unmounted it earlier. Oops. So now that that upper is removed, there was nothing else that was referencing any of those snapshots. Uh, so if I go back through here, you can see actually all, now all the snapshots got removed because as soon as I deleted that, uh, that, um, that snapshot that I was referring to, um, uh, nothing else was referencing any of that content. Uh, so that's, that's basically how our garbage collector works. You can kind of rely on it from the client perspective. To, it can delete things quickly and it can delete things reliably. Uh, so you know that uh, after, after your command returns that something is deleted, that it, it is deleted, that this, the, the metadata store no longer has any reference to it. The garbage collection runs very quickly um, and it runs fairly shortly after. Uh, we also have an ability to run it uh, synchronously uh, for some use cases where you actually need that data gone from disk. Uh, so you can delete images synchronously. And with that, I'm out of time. Uh, we're at, I think we're at, we're at time now, uh, but we're gonna be around for questions. Uh, we have maintainers, Stephen Day, uh, Mike Brown, Phil Estes here. Uh, so feel free to come ask us questions. Um, I'll also be at the Docker booth tomorrow at 10.30 if you wanna come and talk more about Containerd. Um, thank you all for attending.